quarter of a billion people have moved through economic growth from poverty to middle class. That is a huge achievement. 时隔十三年 ，APEC 再次来到中国主场。专访 APEC 秘书处执行主任艾伦·波拉德。大家好，欢迎收看《风云对话》，我是小田。那我们现在呢是在北京 APEC 峰会的现场。那今年呢，时值 APEC 组织成立二十五周年，也是第二次由中国主办 APEC 峰会。那第一次呢是在十三年前的上海。那这一次 APEC 峰会，它的优先主题包括更加开放的市场、更加优化的政策以及更加完善的基础设施建设。从最基本的话题跟我们聊起，说一说究竟何为 APEC，APEC APEC 究竟为何 ？Good evening, Dr. Bollard. Thank you very much for making time and joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, great pleasure. And uh, first of all, as the uh, executive director to the APEC Secretariat, could you please start this interview with your organization? Sure. Uh, I'm very proud to be here because we're reaching a very important part of the year. But um, the APEC Secretariat, which is based in Singapore, is the part of this very big APEC organization that helps make these years run smoothly and helps get what we want from the leaders' meetings and the ministers' meetings. So this year started off um, with many, many meetings in Beijing, other places in China, some other places around the Pacific Rim as well. And uh, we've been helping the Chinese government as they work through this year about what we're going to achieve. We have a fairly small group in Singapore. And first of all, my question is uh, why the headquarters is actually in Singapore? Oh, okay. And uh, as you mentioned, the uh, economies uh, having the uh, representatives in Singapore. I mean, uh, there are only 21 economies in the uh, APEC uh, entity, and uh, well, there are actually much more countries. There's some parts of Central America that aren't members, but almost all. So. Those members joined in the early years, and in the early years, the government of Singapore said, come to Singapore and you can we offer you a building to operate in, and we know that Singapore is a very efficient place to operate from. Um, Sometimes we're there, but quite often we're traveling to other economies around the APEC region for APEC purposes, so it's good hub to travel from. And it's been 25 years uh, since the uh, exactly. starting of uh, APEC. So how would you assess the development of APEC? No, it's been 25 years, exactly. 25 years ago, the first ministers, trade ministers meeting was held in Australia, in Canberra. And it's moved since then. It's grown hugely. There are many uh, developments that have happened, many achievements. But I would say, in that time, maybe one quarter of a billion people have moved through economic growth from poverty into middle class. That is a huge achievement. Now that's not all just APEC, but APEC has helped open up trade, open up investment, and some of that has helped growth in the region, and that's been the result, so that is huge. But of course, it doesn't just happen easily like this. It requires a lot of work and a lot of detail. So APEC actually has about 40 or 50 working groups. They're all working away on technical issues to try and make it easier to trade, to invest, for people to move, for technology to move, all those sorts of things. So if we come back to this very APEC meeting in Beijing 2014, mm. what would you say are the biggest achievements so far? Well, there's some very specific big deliverables, but to put them in context, we all know now that there's more trade, more growth. But actually, since the global financial crisis, things have been changing, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen that growth, that trade growth continue. It's been slower, and actually, economic growth has been slower as well. So there's been quite a lot of concern about what does that mean for the future. President G, talking to the APEC CEO summit, said we are in a new world. Economies are going to have to operate differently, 
and that's true in China, but it's actually true in all the economies around the Pacific Rim as well. So we've been looking at that and new, looking for new engines to drive growth in economies. And some of the things that will be delivered this year are aimed at that new world. So I would say there's three big things. One is the announcement of a free trade area for Asia and the Pacific. This is saying there's a lot of trade agreement negotiations going on around the region. Actually, there's over a hundred. Mm -hmm. But the big ones we hear about are TPP, which has got US and Japan, and Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which has got ASEAN, China, India. We don't want to see them going off in different directions like that. We want to see them heading in the same direction. China, this time, has helped promote the idea of a free trade area for Asia and the Pacific out in the future. What we've agreed to do is a study to see whether or not that would be practical. So that's looking out into the future. It's saying what might be there beyond TPP, beyond RCEP, how do we keep this region opening up and not just trade, but new um, new generation issues as well. Zhuhardi and speaking of this uh, FTAAP, as we just mentioned, we understand that a roadmap is uh, being constructed at this moment. And uh, first of all, for how long you can actually see this happen? And uh, uh, during uh, this uh, period of time that's uh, preparing for this, what do you see the biggest obstacles? Well, you're, you're right. We're looking at a roadmap now, and over the next two years, a strategic study to see whether or not it looks like we should go ahead on FTA. And this idea has been around for a while, but we've never really worked out exactly what it means, what it involves, how would we get there, are there a number of different ways of getting there, how long would that take, does it mean TPP plus, or are there a number of different routes, or stepping stones across a river, mm. and those are the things that we're going to investigate in the study coming up. There will absolutely be right around the region. It won't just be China, but it will be all the economies in the region. That's how we have to move. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned that there are three major achievements that there are going to be during this APEC in Beijing. And at the FTAAP is one of them. And that was about that. It's number one. Yeah. And number two, well, we're approving a connectivity blueprint. So what's been happening with these economies is that we have looked at ways of reducing border controls and looked at ways of getting regulation, regulatory reform behind the border. Now we want to find other ways to help connect up these economies. Some of that has, this also has three parts to it. Some, part of it is helping build infrastructure in the region. China has been keen on this because China has a big record of building infrastructure and funding infrastructure as well. But actually it's an issue for all economies in the region for developing ones, absolutely. In addition to physical infrastructure, uh, APEC is part of the connectivity blueprint, is looking at ways to join up regulations, laws, and institutions. And this relates to some trade facilitation and some regulatory reform and making sure we've got similar standards in all the economies where possible. In addition, we want people to be able to move around better than they have in the past. Uh, so far, uh, we have the APEC Business Travel Card, mm -hmm. which says that if you have one of these and you're moving between APEC economies, you get an automatic business visa in most economies and fast-track entry. It's been really valuable. We'd like to try and find ways of extending that. There's uh, topics under discussion about could particular skill groups get some arrangement like that. Mm -hmm. We're looking at how students could move uh, more easily, student mobility, 
uh, we're looking to have tourists who get better mobility as well. And that is absolutely good news. As a matter of fact, I once tried to apply for APEC business card yes. and I failed because I'm not a business woman. So it seems like uh, the range is going to cover more people rather than just business uh, persons. Well, I, I applied for business travel card and I got one. So this depends on your own economy <laughs> and the rules that they lay down. Right, okay. Uh, and they're very useful. In addition, a third area of deliverable that China has been promoting this year has been looking at new sources for economic growth. Now, some of these are smaller projects and they're, to be honest, pioneering um, experimental as well. We're looking at ways whereby there might be some possibilities with, for environmental technologies to help drive better growth where there might be ways where economic development around the oceans can help drive growth, where urbanization can be a growth engine, where the internet economy can assist. These are saying it's a new world, uh, as President Xi said.